Hey everybody, Jem Schofield here and welcome to the 4K for 10K camera series. If you have not yet done so, please watch the overview video where I talk about the criteria for the six candidate cameras that we are featuring. I also want to mention that this series is not about doing a direct comparison between the cameras. It is not a video based user manual for each of the cameras, nor in-depth reviews of the cameras that are featured. The whole purpose of this series is to help you figure out which camera or cameras that we are covering might be right for your productions. A camera series would not be complete without some test footage. So we decided that we were going to record to each of these cameras internally at their highest resolution and at the best formats and codecs that they could record to internally. In this particular video, we're going to be talking about the Sony FS7 II, so let's get started. Let's take a look at what the FS7 II comes with when you buy the basic camera package. We of course have the camera body itself. We have this handle over here. We have a shock mount. We have this extension arm here. It's the only camera in the series that ships with an extension arm. What's nice about this extension arm now is it's a toolless design, so it's very easy to adjust that and you don't need to have an additional screwdriver. And then we have the grip, which has tremendous functionality on the FS7 II. We have the release here, which is super easy to use and lets you get that into a number of different positions. We have start, stop, record. We have user assignable button number five, which by default is the user menu, which is great. We have this joystick, which lets you choose and select items inside of your menus. We have the zoom rocker here, which with a lens like this will actually, with the servo, control the lens. Another assignable button, which by default is focus magnification. And then we have this dial here, which would generally be used for iris. And then over here on this side, we have our viewfinder, which is actually an LCD screen. And then attached to it, also coming with the camera system, is this unit right here, which serves two purposes. If I press and release, it becomes a hood here for this LCD screen. And then if I drop it down, we have this eyepiece here with a built-in diopter, which you use with this viewfinder. Now it's not a traditional electronic viewfinder and there isn't one that comes with the camera system, but this is their solution for this camera where it can basically be used as both. In fact, if I release this bottom part here and take that off of the camera, you can see that we can now use this just as a standard monitor or screen. Now, additionally, if I just pan the camera over here and we take a look at the front of the camera system, uh, one of the big things that we want to talk about here is this locking E-mount. And this is an E-mount based camera system. So this and the FS5 II are our two cameras in the series which use a different than EF mount standardly. So what we do here is we press the release and then we line those dots up. And then when I put my lens onto here and I go ahead and I lock it into place, then that release actually locks. So the nice thing about this is if I were releasing a standard positive locking mount and I got to this position here, the lens would just come right out. But there's a safety here, so I do have to go in here, press release, and then the lens will drop. So you always still have to spot that lens. That's very, very important. But that extra level of security there is really, really nice. But the huge advantage of having this locking E-mount on the camera system is that it's more robust and I have a lot more confidence when I'm putting larger lenses onto the camera system. It's still a good idea to have some sort of lens support on there with a rod based system. But in this situation, at least you can feel more confident when you're putting these larger lenses on the camera. Now, speaking of lensing your camera systems, when you have a company like Sony that makes camera bodies and also lenses, you can get as an option lenses like this 18 to 110, which really takes this camera and allows you to use it in a more ENG style, EFP style, type of setup. And this particular 18 to 110 is great because once it's attached to the FS7 II and you're using the remote grip, you can actually use this zoom rocker here with the camera system and you can control this 18 to 110 using that. And that's our lens system attached using this locking E-mount. And a couple of other things that are included with the system here, you do get a BPU-30 
battery and you do get a charger which also doubles as an AC or mains power for your camera system. And then also this little shoulder pad right here which we don't have attached to the camera which goes underneath. And this allows you to basically just have a slight padding here. It doesn't mean that it's gonna replace a full shoulder mount kit, but for a lot of people when they're using it with the FS7 II, it's enough, especially when they're using that extension and that remote grip unit. And you can see how that's being used in this shot right here. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the camera from an operator's standpoint. We're going to go over here to the front left of the camera system and we have our ND system and this definitely is something that we want to focus on that is unique to only two of the cameras in our series, the FS7 II and the FS5 II and it is the variable ND system. Now in its most basic, the ND is not unlike most cameras. We have a clear setting here, we go to one, by default, that's two stops of ND. We have two, which is four stops of ND, and we have three, which is six stops. We can go into the menu systems on this camera and we can change it from anywhere between two and seven stops. So we can change these presets to be different values if we want. But the real power comes in when we switch this over to variable and we make sure here that this switch here is set to ND. And then this particular dial on the camera system now allows us to pull ND. Now, as you can imagine, being able to just incrementally change the ND in between those steps that you're used to using allows you to have a granularity that you don't usually get in a camera. But additionally, when you're running and gunning and you're a single operator, where the power really comes in is when you have huge exposure changes and you don't want to use your aperture or your ISO to change exposure levels. So what we can do is we can set this to an auto mode and I can actually assign that to one of these assignable buttons. In this particular shot, we are in an interior location where we have exposure on a particular part of the room. And then as we pan the camera, we can see that more available light is coming in, but very gradually we can see that that variable ND is kicking in. And what it's doing is it's allowing us to change our exposure without changing our aperture or our gain values. You can see here, and I did mention the signable buttons, there are a lot of them on the camera system. And I really like this trend on camera systems allowing the operator to tweak the camera to the way they like to use it. Easy access to get to our menu systems, which we'll take a look at in a minute, and also very easy access to changing our audio controls, but a little door, which of course prevents you from changing your levels when you are using the camera. So over here is where our cards are in this protected bay over here, and this camera system is a little bit different. It uses XQD cards. They are more expensive than SD cards, but they are more cost effective, at least at this time, than CFast cards. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put that back into the slot. Now when we come over here to the right side of the camera body, we have our output ports. So you've got the two SDI terminals here that are pushing out a 1080 signal. And then you have, of course, the 4K internal recording. And then we have this HDMI 2.0 terminal, and this will allow us to push out a 4K signal to an external recorder. But if you really wanna push out a 4K signal from the FS7 II, what you need to do is get an additional piece of equipment from Sony. And this will, of course, add to the cost of the overall camera system. So this may push you over that $10,000 US, but it is something that gives you a lot of additional functionality. We have, very importantly, a raw output. So we can actually do a raw output now with this extension unit from the camera system, and that is giving you the ability to record in 4K in raw to an external recorder. And then we go over here and we've got our XLR inputs for the camera body. So you can see those right here. So we have channel one, channel two that go into there. And if we go ahead and take a look at the top handle here, we can see additional functionality. We have a zoom rocker on here, start, stop, record. And then we have this, what's called an MI shoe, which stands for multi-interface shoe. So what I can do is I can take this, which is called the SMAD P3D. And the only reason it's the D version is it's for a dual channel receiver. We have electronics here that match up with that MI shoe. 
and I'm just going to go ahead and insert that into that smart shoe. And then once that's attached, all I have to do is take my receiver here. You'll see that there's this connector, female, and you just slide that right into place and they connect together. You lock it in and now your receiver is going to pass all of that data into the camera system without additional cabling here. And the last thing we'll go over in terms of the exterior is this viewfinder or LCD screen. And if I just turn this on, you'll see there's some additional controls that we have here. So for instance, we have the ability to change the contrast of that screen. We have access to peaking and zebras, and then we can actually flip the screen if we need to, depending on how you actually have that set up for your productions. So now it's time to jump into the menu systems. And what I want to do now is really talk a little bit about how you have two cameras in one in the FS7 II. So the first thing I'm going to do is go over to my camera body and press on the menu button here. And first and foremost, the user menu. Thank you, Sony. As a single camera operator, a lot of the time it is really difficult sometimes to drill down into menu systems and the fact that we have a user menu where we can add things that we want inside of this menu and even in the sort of default it has most of the stuff that you want to get to it really really helps in terms of customizing the camera for you as a user so inside of here and we can get to this from somewhere else in the menus as well we have something called base setting. And this is really, really important to understand with the FS7 II because this is where you basically decide, do I want to set up this camera as a normal sort of typical, almost broadcast style camera with some cinema style features, or do I want to set it up as more of a digital cinema camera? So let's go into custom and take a look at that. So when we're in custom, just think of this camera as the camera you can go in and drill into menus, you can paint in camera, and it is baking whatever you are setting it to into your recorded image. So for instance, if I go into the paint menu here, we can go in and I can drill down here and I can change my gamma settings. So right now I'm in S-Log3. If I change that to a different gamma setting, then it's changing the dynamic range that's being recorded by the camera system. So if you want the most dynamic range, S-Log2 or S-Log3. Now I'll step out of there and we're gonna go into our matrix, which really has to do with our color. And you can see we can go in here and there are also presets that we can choose that have to do with and will change the way our color gamut is being recorded. So I'm going to go in here actually and choose this F55709 like, but there are other options including BT2020. But if you go into these menus and you change a lot of stuff, you can definitely get yourself into trouble. So make sure you refer to the user manual if you're going to be making these changes in terms of gamma and gamuts. So we step out of there and we'll just take a look at a couple of other things when you're inside of the camera system. So we can go up here to camera and in terms of our ISO and gain, we can go in here and we can rate that as a DB or we can rate it as ISO. And then depending on how the camera is set up, we can take our L, M, and H switch positions and we can assign them specific ISOs, which again will be baked into the image. This camera has a base ISO of 2000. That is what it's rated as. But if you do go in and you change things like your gamma, it actually changes what options are available to me in terms of my gain or ISO. So again, when you're inside of this custom mode, it's just remembering that when you're using the camera like this, it's not a LUT-based workflow, and it is what you see is what's being recorded. So stepping out of paint here, I'm going to go down to this menu, System. And this is where base setting and codec and record format actually live, but they're also in the user menu that I showed you before. And we're gonna go back to base setting, and I'm gonna change this now from custom to Cine EI. And when I do that, it's actually gonna have me reboot the camera system so that it effectively becomes this other digital cinema camera. And now I am in Cine EI or Cine Exposure Index. 
Now, once we're in Cine AI, it's very different because you have to think of it more like a cinema camera. So there's going to be a lot of functions, a lot of choices that you have under custom that you don't have here. But there's also some things that we can access inside of Cine EI that are not available in the custom base setting. One of them being the color space combinations with our gamma curves. Now which one of these you choose really depends on your overall workflow. I am currently trying to capture as much color space as I can when I'm shooting with the camera system and also get the widest dynamic range that I can. But I also know that generally, at least nowadays, I am targeting the Rec. 709 triangle and color space when I'm going into post-production. So for that reason, I generally will choose Sgamut 3.cine because that triangle more aligns with the 709 triangle even though it's capturing a much, much larger gamut. And then S-Log3 in terms of that overall gamma curve so that I'm getting that dynamic range that I want out of the sensor. Again, refer to the user manual in terms of how you want to have that set up but this is generally the way that I'm using the camera nowadays. So the other thing to show you here in Cine EI is when we go into things like the paint menu, we'll see that everything is grayed out. So we don't have access like we do in custom to those options. And that also carries forward when we're talking about things like our color temperature. So you can see that there are only three choices here. We have 5500 Kelvin, 4300 Kelvin and 3200 Kelvin. And you may say, well, that's really limiting, but Cine EI is really making you focus on just the simplicity of using the camera system as a digital cinema camera, as opposed to drilling down and painting in camera and doing all of these other things which are getting baked into your image. So that's the approach that Sony took with this camera system. I've actually found it to work very well for when I've used the camera in my productions, and it's just something else that you need to understand about Cine EI. And we'll talk about a couple of other things that are related to using the camera, some of them specific to Cine EI and some of them being more global settings. So in terms of more global, we'll talk about codecs. So you'll see XABCI, and that's probably the codec that you're going to use most of the time to record internally, 10-bit, 422, high data rate, and a rich image that you can work with in post-production. I have really been happy with the image that you get using that codec inside of the camera. And additionally, you'll see that there are some grayed out options here. If I add the extension unit, which I showed you earlier on, those become available. Okay, so let's step back out here and take a look at a couple of other things. Let's go into recording format and we can see that there are a lot of options there in terms of the way we can record internally. And we can record up to 60p in 4K, 10-bit 422. So again, really, really nice in terms of being able to do that. And also in DCI 4K or in UHD and of course, we can also record in 1080 to the camera system. So let's pop into the monitor LUT or lookup table menu. And we have three options under category. We have LUT. And if we go into the LUT select here, you can see some of the options that are available to you. We have another option, which is look profile. And these look profiles are also LUTs created by Sony that you can access. I'm a big fan of the LC, which is low contrast 709 type A, which I feel when I'm using this mode, the Cine EI mode, gives me a LUT that more approximates what I would probably be looking for in terms of my final image in post-production if I was targeting a 709 color space. So you have that option there. And then the third option you have under category is user 3D LUT and you can actually load LUTs into your camera system and access those, so that's a fantastic feature. And then you have the options of being able to turn on and off those LUTs in terms of where they're being routed. So just be aware that when you're choosing SDI-1 and internal recording, what you're doing is you are pushing a LUT out of the SDI-1 port on the side of the camera system, but you are also baking that LUT into your recorded image. So that is very important to understand. If you don't want to bake it into the recorded image, then don't turn that on. 
So in this case, what I'm gonna do is turn on that LUT for my viewfinder, which is right here. But again, because we didn't turn it on for internal recording, that is just a monitoring LUT. It is not being recorded to the card on the camera system. So we're gonna jump into ISO gain exposure index. And inside of here is where you set where your low, your medium, and your high ISO settings are. And when you're doing this, you might think, as if you were in the custom base setting, that when you change these settings that you are going to record your image at those ISOs. And that's actually not true. When you're using Cine EI in the camera system, you are always recording at a 2000 ISO or exposure index. So that's definitely something that you have to get used to with the camera system. The fact that we know that the recorded image in Cine EI is always 2000 ISO means that we have to understand how we can monitor an image if we want to rate that differently in post-production. So what you can do here is you can assign your switches on the side of your camera to different exposure index values. And this is just for monitoring purposes. So I'm just gonna step out here and show you our image. And if I change that switch from low to medium to high, I am actually gonna be seeing an image that looks more or less exposed because I'm rating my camera to say, in post-production, I'm gonna take this 2000 ISO based exposed image and I'm going to change the exposure to match it so that it would be more like an image that was captured at 800 ISO. So it's a little bit of a different workflow. You have to get used to it. You'll refer to the user manual and you may do a little bit more studying up on it, but it is my preferred way to use this camera system. I am shooting in Cine EI with this camera exclusively for the type of work that I do, but there are a lot of shooters out there who would prefer to use custom, be able to paint in camera, and also bake that look into their final image. So it's just basically different strokes for different folks when you are using the FS7 II. And I think that as a result, you really have a camera system that gives you so many options in terms of how you can use it. Now the last thing that I'm going to show you here is something called high-low key. And as long as you have a LUT applied, we have the ability to remap the way this monitor here is showing us our image because it's pretty limited in terms of the range that it can show us our image. So what I've done is I've gone into my assignable button menu and I've taken number two and assigned that to high-low key. So when I press it once, I see high key, and when I'm looking at high key, what I'm doing is I'm remapping this monitor so I can see into the highlights. Am I retaining that highlight information? When I press it again, it will show me low key, which it remaps to show me to make sure that I know that I am recording the information in the shadows and then we go back to the original image. So what this does is it gives you confidence as an operator in terms of making sure you know that you're capturing that information in your recorded image. So now it's time to jump into our menu again and take a look at how we had the camera set up for the recording of the sample footage to the internal cards. And we had our camera set up to recording format at DCI 4K 4096 by 2160 at 23.98. And then we also had it set up to record in the XABCI codec. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look now at the recorded images that we did at Able Cine in New York with the FS7 II. Here are our three shooting scenarios that we are gonna be showing you. And they are an interior low light example, an exterior, example and also a mixed lighting example. So our low light test was really again to do something where we were shooting in low light and pushing the sensor a little bit. Just a large soft key source. We had a little bit of light in the background. We wanted to make sure that there was some color in that image so that you could see how it reacts to that. But also to make sure that we had dynamic range in the frame. For our exterior, we wanted to simulate as close as we could bright daylight, but with high dynamic range throughout the image. We're not using any bounce cards. 
There's no negative fill. We're just using the light that is available to us in that space. And then for this scenario, we really wanted to make sure that we were kind of mimicking a typical situation where you might have some mixed lighting. We're using lots of practicals. There's obviously daylight coming into the space. And we also have a couple of fixtures that are playing here. The main one is our key light for our main talent in the foreground. And then there's a small light down there in the back left of the frame, which is just basically throwing a little bit of a pool of light into that shadowy area to lift it a little bit. And again, the goal was to show you and give you something with some real dynamic range to play with in the image. Let's take a look at our settings when recording to the FS7 II for our low light test. And now we're taking a look at that same footage without the information up on the screen, but please remember that this is heavily compressed if you are watching this video. You really need to download the source footage from the camera system to see what you can do with that image. Now we're taking a look at that same picture, but with a Rec. 709 LUT applied, so you can get a sense of what that might look like in production if you had a viewing LUT up on a screen. Now we move to our exterior natural daylight scenario with the FS7 II, and here are our settings in the camera system. Now we're taking a look at that entire frame without information up on the screen, so you can see that log footage and also get a sense of the dynamic range. And here it is with the Rec. 709 LUT applied, just to give you a sense of what it looks like in that gamma and color space. We move to our last test scenario, which is our mixed lighting setup, and here are our settings inside of the camera system. And to give you a sense of our frame here, here's what it looks like without the information up on the screen, so you can see the entire image. And here we are taking a look at that FS7 II footage in that mixed lighting scenario with a Rec. 709 LUT applied. So the goal here, regardless of low light, exterior, or sort of a mixed lighting situation, was to show you a lot of dynamic range within each of these images. So we were exposing for middle gray to where we should have for each of those cameras, and that allowed us to make sure that we had proper exposure for you to start with with your images. So there you have it, that's the Sony FS7 II, and hopefully this video has helped you in some ways figure out what this camera is all about and how it might fit in some or all of your productions. I do recommend that you download the sample files and footage from this camera and the other cameras from this series. Thanks for watching.